Come, you thankful people, come. Raise the song of harvest home. All is safely gathered in ere the winter storms begin. God, our Maker, does provide for our wants to be supplied. Come to God's own temple. Come, raise the song of harvest home. Well, greetings, friends, and welcome to the Fellowship of Rocky River Presbyterian Church in Rocky River, Ohio. I'm John Fancher, the pastor of the church, and I'm so glad that you are here for worship in these days leading up to our country's National Day of Thanksgiving. Truly, God's Holy Spirit is drawing us together through time and space so that we can be at worship together. Would you bow with me in prayer? Gracious and provident God, as you gather us together for praise and prayer, we know there is unmet need in the world. The good fortune we enjoy is only partially due to our own cleverness and perseverance. Perhaps our sin includes our need to be reminded periodically to be thankful. God, we pray that you understand and accept our selfishness, but that you won't settle for it and that we won't either. May the seed of gratitude take root in our hearts and bear fruit which satisfies the hunger of this world. We pray in the name of your gracious gift to us, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, the scripture tells us everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. Blessed are those who ask for forgiveness, for they will be forgiven. Blessed are all who repent, for they shall be freed to live fully in the present with hope for the future. Thanks be to God. To uh, set the stage for our time of reflection today, I'd like to share two passages from the Bible. The first is from the book of Psalms, reading some verses from Psalm 84. The psalmist writes, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of heavenly forces. My very being longs, even yearns for the Lord's courtyards. My heart and my body will rejoice out loud to the living God. Yes, the sparrow too has found a home there. The swallow has found herself a nest where she can lay her young beside your altars, Lord of heavenly forces, my King, my God. Those who live in your house are truly happy. They praise you constantly. Better is a single day in your courtyards than a thousand days anywhere else. I would prefer to stand outside the entrance of my God's house than live comfortably in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. God is favor and glory. The Lord gives, doesn't withhold gives good things to those who walk with integrity. Lord of heavenly forces, those who trust in you are truly happy. And the uh, reading from the New Testament is from the letter to the Ephesians. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and his powerful strength. Put on God's armor so that you can make a stand against the tricks of the devil. We aren't fighting against human enemies, but against rulers, authorities, forces of cosmic darkness, and spiritual powers of evil in the heavens. Therefore, pick up the full armor of God so that you can stand your ground on the evil day, and after you have done everything possible, to stand still. So stand with the belt of truth around your waist, justice as your breastplate, And put shoes on your feet so that you are ready to spread the gospel news of peace. Above all, carry the shield of faith so that you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. Offer prayers and petitions in the Spirit all the time. Stay alert by hanging in there and praying for all believers. You know, when I preach on the book of Ephesians, I think it's good if we're reminded of two things about the title and the author of this letter. First, although many Bibles entitle this book 
Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It should be really called a letter in the tradition of Paul because it was written well after Paul had died. It was written by some of his students, some of his followers who were familiar with Paul's thinking, his theology, and they wanted to continue his ministry. So it's convenient to call the unknown author by the name Paul. And the second reminder is that the oldest existent copies of this letter don't include the Greek phrase that means to the Ephesians. That suggests that this letter wasn't written specifically for the Christians in Ephesus, but rather it was an encyclical or a letter to be circulated among several churches. You might think of it as a to whom it may concern letter. Indeed, some Bible scholars suggest that this letter might actually be the so-called missing letter to the Laodiceans that's mentioned in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. Now, all this is said in the interest of accuracy. In no way is the impact diminished for this letter, which we conveniently call Ephesians, written by an unknown author we conveniently call Paul. Now, this book is famous for that section that we heard today in which God's spiritual blessings to us are described as though they were body armor provided by God. Paul urges each Christian to put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of God's eternal word. Naturally, donning armor is a metaphor. Paul's not calling the Christian church to form a militia, and there was no need for that. It doesn't appear that Christians in that time and place were being particularly persecuted by their neighbors or by the government. The situation of those early Christians was nothing like, say, the situation of 20th century African Americans living in the Deep South who were in real danger of being lynched for no reason at all by ignorant, violent mobs of racists. No, it seems unlikely that many Christians in Paul's time were threatened with physical violence because of their acceptance of Jesus Christ. So what did Paul have in mind then when he urged Christians to put on the spiritual armor of God? What was their greatest threat? Well, what threatened them is what still threatens Christians today. We're vulnerable to selling out our faith, compromising what we believe in, so we don't have to make tough choices. Christians in Paul's day had to make tough choices. Uh, As you well know, some of the Christians in those early days had formerly been Jewish. And they may have felt some urge to maintain Jewish customs, to keep up the appearance of Jewish life so they wouldn't alienate their Jewish friends or or feel left out of Jewish society. Perhaps they were battling with the temptation to compromise their faith so they would still be acceptable to their friends. Other Christians in those days had formerly been pagans worshiping local folk deities, like uh, fertility gods, the moon and sun, gods of good fortune, and so on. Because the worship of those gods may have become strong family traditions, those formerly pagan Christians may have been reluctant to stop honoring those gods at family altars. Perhaps they were battling the temptation to compromise their faith so that they could keep familiar, comfortable traditions like worshiping idols. Well, maybe some of those early Christians were engaged in occupations that the rest of the church found offensive, such as piracy, prostitution, collaboration with the Roman army, or extortion under the guise of tax collecting. Maybe those new Christians were reluctant to give up those lucrative occupations, Perhaps they were battling with the temptation to compromise their faith so they could continue to do things that were contrary to God's will. 
and in some cases against the law. But when you believe Jesus Christ calls you to commit yourself completely to God's service, you're faced with some powerful enemies. It's as dangerous as being a double agent if you think you can serve both God and human desires. You need some strong stuff to do battle with the seductive, alluring enemies. And that's why Paul urged the Ephesians to clothe themselves with the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, and so on. That clothing metaphor it reminds me of that inevitable question that's shouted by photographers to celebrities sporting those fabulous evening gowns as they stroll down the red carpet. They shout out, Who are you wearing? Well, we Christians should answer, We are wearing God. In this enlightened, educated day and age, what are we modern Christians vulnerable to? Are our struggles much different from the struggles of the ancient Christians? I don't think so. It's as though we've invented other gods that compete with Jesus Christ for claim on our lives. What might some of those other modern gods be? Well, I think many of us are lured by the gods of conspicuous consumption. We want to have it all because we pretty much can have whatever we really need. Well, at least we could until the supply chain disruptions caused by the pandemic. We can't believe that we can't have whatever we want whenever we want it. But in the depths of our hearts, don't you think that we feel uneasy because we know that there are so many others in the world who would welcome the chance to live on what we throw away. I think many of us are tempted by the gods of self-centeredness. We find it easier to look out for ourselves and ignore others than to consider the impact that our choices have on others and then act in a responsible manner as a result. And I think many of us are seduced by the gods of workaholism. We think that work is the most important aspect of our lives and that our value as a person, as a spouse, as a parent, a provider, that's determined by our achievements and by our output. We forget that work is intended to be a means to an end, namely to provide for the household and to contribute to the public good. And I think many of us are mesmerized by the gods of leisure and pleasure. We mistakenly imagine that entertainment is an obligation, and that we're entitled to feel good at all times. The result is that we face as many temptations as those Christians addressed in the Bible. Temptations to give only partial allegiance to God and to devote an inappropriate amount of attention to ourselves, our wants, our desires, our sense of self-determination. In the same way that uh, a married man who's having an affair is said to be cheating on his wife because he's not giving all of himself to her, we tend to cheat God by holding back part of ourselves. We hold back because we've been deceived by a consumer-oriented, hedonistic, you-can-have-it-all society, deceived into imagining that we know better than God what we really need. Society isn't persecuting us. It's eroding our spiritual commitment. We need strong armor to withstand society's subtle but persistent assaults against us. Well, have I got something for you. It's God's armor, spiritual armor that protects us with truth, righteousness, faith, salvation, enthusiasm, because we know God's good news in Jesus Christ. When we try to go it alone without the power of God, we are as powerless and vulnerable as a soldier without the proper equipment and protection. But when we immerse ourselves in God, 
We're protected like a soldier outfitted for battle. We receive strength beyond our ability to withstand the subtle but persistent assaults against our trust in God. Now, there have been times in the past when it was easier to be a Christian than it is today. Church was not just a religious center, but it was also the social center of a community. The entertainment industry uh, used to show more respect for organized religion than it does today. There didn't used to be anywhere near as many activity options competing against a Sabbath day of rest and worship. And the work world has blurred the distinction between company time and personal time. People of faith today are the easy target of ridicule or they're dismissed as irrational. No, being a Christian is no cakewalk. Subtle forces try to neutralize our influence, to downplay our significance. But as we heard from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, God offers us the resources to be able to stand firm, knowing that our trust in God is wisely invested. Would you pray with me? God, our protector, open our eyes to the subtle forces that try to pull us away from you. Guard us, arm us with your spiritual blessings so we may remain completely devoted to you through our trust in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, friends, in this community of faith, in this church, we pray for and care for one another, and we pray for and seek to care for the world. One of the ways we do that each week is by selecting at random members of this church to be in our prayer focus for the week ahead. This week in our prayer focus, we remember Dave and Sharon, Michelle, Marty and Dick, Eva, AJ and Julianne, and their son, Nico. And we've received many prayer requests uh, by telephone and by email in recent days. We want to pray for Joe and Susan and their families undergoing a very stressful time. We pray for Laura in her time of discernment. We pray for protection and strength for people who are struggling against addiction. We offer prayers of comfort and strength for Taya in the hospital. We offer prayers for continued healing for Lewis, for Janice, for Carol. We pray for safety for baby William, for reassurance and health for Rachel, for Kaylin, for Holly. We offer prayers for Thomas and Melissa and their family grieving his father's death. And we hold Linda and John and Kathy in the secure comfort of prayer. And you know, the pain of loss becomes especially tender as we approach this season of holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year. Because some have lost loved ones in recent months or years and still feel the pain of loss as they remember that face, as they still hear that voice. But there are other losses, too, that we may feel more painfully over the holidays, like losses of relationships, the loss of employment, the loss of a pet, the loss of health, the loss of hopes and dreams. And so we pause to gather up the pain of the past and let us take our sadness, our sorrow, our disappointment, our emptiness and offer it to God, asking that from God's hands we will receive the gift of peace. Would you pray with me? God of eternity, source of life, fount of love, as we approach this holiday season, memories of Thanksgivings and Christmases past remind us of the affection we have for family, for friends, neighbors. 
Those we've lost across the years live on in our celebrations by your Holy Spirit's gift of memory. This year, the caution we feel as we contemplate gatherings of family and friends adds to the heaviness on our hearts. We're weary from having to press on and endure through these pandemic days and weeks and months. Tender shepherd, heal our hearts, yearning for the presence of those not with us. Heal our spirits, aching for a return to a time when the most ordinary activities aren't complicated by the threat of illness. God, you are our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. We pray that our spirit of gratitude at Thanksgiving that our amazement and joy at your nativity in Bethlehem will continue to inspire our hearts and shape our words and deeds, regardless of how our holiday observances may differ this year. As the glow of a simple candle can light a whole room, we pray that your gift of a spirit of gratitude and compassion, a glow within us, will enable us to be a light to the world, revealing your gracious love for one and all. And so bless us, we pray, with the ability to see the gifts with which you fill our lives. Empower us, God, to share your blessings by the way we choose to live our lives, striving to embody the Spirit of Jesus in our actions and to speak the peace of Jesus in our words. To that end, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you for being part of this worship service. You are the reason we are here to inspire and to comfort and to encourage you in your calling to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ in your daily life. If you have comments or reactions or suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. Please drop us a line or give us a call. And obviously, we welcome your prayer requests at any time. You can share as much or as little detail as you're comfortable sharing. And please let me know if you would like me to hold your prayer request in pastoral confidence or if you would like me to share that prayer request in an upcoming worship service. Your financial gifts and offerings continue to support the charitable mission outreach efforts and the ministry of this church, and we thank you. You can bring gifts to the church, drop in the mail, use your bank's bill pay program, or you can make gifts through our website. I also invite you to join many other members and friends of this church by making a commitment of financial support for our ministry and mission for the year ahead. Many are dropping off or mailing to the church a stewardship, a financial pledge form for 2022. You can explore what this means for you by going to our website and clicking on the tab that says 2022 Stewardship. Our website is www.riverpress.org. You'll find new worship broadcasts posted on our church's Facebook page and our church's YouTube channel. They're posted every Saturday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and you can watch them at your convenience anytime after that. In addition to these worship broadcasts, we also offer in-person worship services in our sanctuary at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Masks are required for anyone entering the church building, regardless of vaccination status. And now, friends, as we conclude our time together in worship, hear this charge from the Thanksgiving hymn, Now Thank We All Our God, that says, O oh, may this bounteous God through all our life be near us, with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us, and keep us in God's grace and guide us when perplexed, and free us from all ills in this life and the next. 
And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit guide you, guard you, and encourage you today and forever. Amen.